This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Well, our scriptural lesson today comes from Mark chapter 2, verse 18 down through verse 22, reading from the New Living Translation of the Scripture. Notice there these words. Once when John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, some people came to Jesus and asked, why don't your disciples fast like John's disciples and the Pharisees do? Jesus replied, Do wedding guests fast while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. They can't fast while the groom is with them, but someday the groom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts wine into old wineskin, for the wine would burst the wineskins, and the wine and the skins would both be lost. New wine calls for new wineskins. Speaking today from the subject, embrace the new. Embrace the new. What is it new that God might be bringing to you that was not in your thinking prior to? What new paradigm might God be showing you? What new strategy, what new way of thinking or new way of doing something that God might be bringing to you that we need to embrace? Uh, we don't resist change, we resist being changed. And the body recalls from change. You know, you get used to a routine. If you've got your, your knives and forks and spoons in a certain drawer in your kitchen, and if you move them, by habit, you'll go back to the place that you used to have them. If the plates and saucers and glasses were on this side and you move them on that side, out of habit, you'll, you'll go back to the old place where it was because we resist change. And so we don't like to embrace the new. It's, it's just easy for us to just do what we've always been doing. You know, it's, if your bed is out in the, in, in the center of the floor where you can get off on either the right or the left side, the vast majority of people always sleep on the same side of the bed. Even if you travel and go out, go out of town to a hotel, you get on your side. And you know which side of the bed is your side. It's because we resist change. You know, we just, we don't like to, to change because you have to think about what you're doing when you have to embrace that new change. Here's where they were where they didn't necessarily like that. And, and they're bringing into the picture here the same thing that, that is the tragedy of our internet is that it causes, our social media causes comparisons. And they're saying, hey, 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 Jesus, why is it that your disciples don't fast like John's disciples? I mean, John and Jesus were really on the same team. But John did it one way and Jesus did it another. Just because you do something differently doesn't mean that you're not on the same team. We all wound up on the same, at the same location today, but most of us came by different ways. Some people came 285 North, some people came 285 South. You know, then we all had to merge on to 20 West coming here. The other, but some people coming in from Douglasville, you had to come 20 East. And it, isn't it amazing that we were able to do different things and yet wind up at the same place? You all don't live in my neighborhood. I don't live in your neighborhood. And yet we wind up at the same place. There are different roads that have left, led us here to the same direction. And I don't know about you, but you know when Atlanta's traffic gets congested, I, I'm trying to search, I'm going to Google Maps and saying, hey, show me, show me the, how to lead me around the, the traffic. I want to go the quickest way. I mean, if it doesn't save me but two minutes, I'm taking it. 
<laughs> if it's five minutes shorter this way, I'm taking it. I'm in. Count me in. And so I don't care if I came this way. I'm going back another way. You have to be able to embrace change because doing something the way that you've always done it is not necessarily always the best route. And here's the principle is that what got you here won't necessarily get you there. Sometimes you've got to step up and bump up what you've been doing in order to go to the, to the next level. If you keep on doing it, you've heard it, if you keep on doing what you've always done, you'll keep on getting what you've always gotten. So when you want something that is beyond that, you've got to embrace something that is new. And this is all that Jesus is bringing them into doing. And he's telling them, listen, see, in the Jewish festival of a marriage ceremony, you didn't just go in and have a little one-hour ceremony, one and a half hours, and have a little punch and Kool-Aid and go home. No, no, no. They, they had a, the wedding feast lasted for seven days. These folks were partying for seven days. Some people just look for any reason to party, and they had liquor there. <laughs> I mean, they had, a, they had a party. The Jews knew how to partay. And they parted for seven days. Food galore, wine galore. They celebrated. It was a festival. It was a celebration, and they knew how to celebrate. There was dancing and music. And he says, listen, while the bridegroom is with you, there's no need to fast. You don't go to a party to say, oh, oh, no, I'm fasting. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's the time to indulge. Go there and, and, and enjoy the, the, the party. Can you imagine if you were throwing a party and all of your guests showed up and said, oh, I'm fasting, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. <laughs> Jesus said the time to fast is not while the bridegroom is with you. This is a time to celebrate. Jesus was saying, I am the bridegroom. And I'm getting the church, my bride comes out of the church. I'm getting her ready. This is a time for celebration. He said, I want you to celebrate. That's a great marriage feast. Jesus did his very first miracle at a wedding where he took water and turned it into wine. He takes the mundane and turns it into something that is flavorful. He takes what is dull and insip it and turns it into that that has efficacy to it. And so he's bringing us into a new paradigm. And so he says, now is not the time to fast. You see, when you fast, fasting is, is when we actually yield to God and submit our will to God's will. That's what fasting is about. It's about yielding and submitting your will to God's will. Now, some people call it fasting when actually what they're doing is a hunger strike. But a hunger strike is when we try to get God to submit his will to our will. Like, Lord, I'm turning my plate down. Lord, until you change him, until I get this job, to this money, to my... That's a hunger strike. When you don't like the conditions as they are and you say, I'm not going to eat until you straighten this out. That's a hunger strike. You're trying to get God to submit to your demands. No, no, no. The fast is so that you can submit your will to God's will. To, you, it's dying to yourself. It's like I'm turning this down, I'm with re refraining from this so that my flesh will die and I'll come on to one accord with your spirit, God. And this is why Jesus is saying, listen, you're already with me. We're already on one accord. There's no need for you to fast. We're already together. You're together with me. There's no need to fast right now. And so the question is, is why do we hold on to things that we no longer use? I mean, I know that we have a certain amount of nostalgia about certain things. It has meaning to it, you know. You know, my great-grandmother gave me this. And then there's my granddaddy's, you know. I understand that we attach sentimental value to particular things from the past. But embrace the new. Em embrace the new. You have to learn how to embrace what is new that God is bringing into your life. And if you don't let go of some of the old, you won't have room to be able to embrace the new. And so he, he's, he's saying to us, it's time to be able to embrace some of the new things that I want you to bring into your life. The only reason that we have people that are, that are pack rats, you might know some of them. They don't, they've got stuff. They just have stuff, rooms of stuff. I mean, they clip newspaper articles, magazine articles. They just got... I mean, they, it's just stuff, clothes and shoes and jewelry. It's just stuff, furniture. It's just 
stuff and it's piled up and they don't want to get rid of anything. You know why? Because in their thinking, one day I might need this. And that, that's the thinking of the, of, of the pack rat. It's like, we don't ever know when we're going to need this. And so you keep on piling up stuff and piling on stuff, and we don't know how to, to let it go. And, and see, here, here's, here's, here's the deal. When you continue what you should change, when you continue what you should change, you become irrelevant. But when you change what you should continue, you become unstable. And so there are certain things that you don't change. These are our principles. You don't change principles. These are our values. You don't change values. This is the vision. You don't just change the vision and say, okay, this is our family vision. This week, the next week, we'll have another vision. No, no, no. You just have an overarching vision, and you need to pursue that. When God gives you a purpose, you know, know what to, to keep as the constant. And when God has given you something, this is our foundation. We treat people right. We are fair with people. We tell the truth. These are foundational principles. This is solid. Don't change that. If you change what you should keep, you will destabilize your life and become confused in your identity. So, and then if you hang on to stuff that you need to change, you become eccentric, irrelevant, a weirdo, and they won't be able to connect with other generations because they don't understand why is it that you still have a horse and buggy and it's taking you three days to get over here when you can get here in the car in 45 minutes. So. You have to be able to know, what do I hold on to? What do I let go of? But in the whole idea of the, the old wineskin, it has already served its purpose, and so you have to let it go. But you see, wineskins were expensive back during the time of, of the first century Christians. It was expensive. And you have to understand, wineskin is, it's, wine is actually a, a wine bottle, so to speak but it is made out of animal products, out of leather. It's made from the skin of goats or the skin of sheep. So it's actually an animal skin, which means in order to produce new wine skin, sacrifices involve something has to die. That's the issue. Sacrifice has to, to come into play in order to get new wine skin because something has to die in order to produce it. And then this is what I want you to realize is that as you age, you need a new structure to thrive. As you age, you need a new structure to thrive. You can't keep on doing what you've been doing. You know, when you, I mean, when you, you know, you, you're a teenager, you're 9 or 10 years old, 12, 15, 18 years old. You just jump out of the bed. You don't have to warm up. You get a certain age, you don't make sudden moves. You can break something. Something can knock out a joint, you know, you, you, you try to, a, a sudden move and your hip is out of place, your knee is out of joint, you, you throw your back out. You know, I, I mean, really, you, you, have, you have to operate differently when you reach a certain age. I mean, I saw a lady, she was all twisted up, I thought she'd been in a car accident. I said, what happened to you, honey? She said, I sneeze too hard. She sneezed and pulled a muscle in her back and she was all contorted. I thought she'd been in a car accident. You, you, have to, you have to measure your, your, your movements when you get a certain age. You don't just climb up on a chair and get up there and just change a, a light bulb. You're you 85 years old. You might have, it's all right to do that at 25. But if you fall out of a chair at 85, you have, somebody's going to have to call 911 for you. You'll be there with your little life alert talking about I fall and I can't get up. So you have to be more calculated. You know, you, you, you can't... You can't, anybody, you know what I'm talking about? You can't just take risks. You have to be very, very calculated. So you get up there on the, on the ladder or on the, on the chair, and they're like, hey, come here, honey, hold this for me. When you're 25, you're not asking anybody to hold anything for you. It's like, I can do this myself. You're standing up there doing that. If you fall, so what? You just pop back, back up. But you get a certain age, and you fall. You got to be carried out. <laughs> it, it, you don't just pop back up. Something is broken. Something is out of joint. Some, something is, is out of place. So you have to learn how 
to have a different structure for every age that you are to learn how, how do I thrive in this season of my life? I mean, it, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter it, whether you're your teachable teens, your tireless 20s, you, you know, your, your t terrific 30s, your forcible 40s, your fearful 50s, your seasoned 60s, your settled 70s, your aching 80s. <laughs> your nebulous 90s or your pernicious hundreds, but wherever you are, wherever you are, every 10 years is a marker for change. Every 10 years is a marker for change. You ought to be able to evaluate your life at every 10 years. You should not be the same at 30 as you were at 20. Don't be in the same place at 40 as you were at 30. Every 10 years is a marker. You ought to be able to say, you know what, I, 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 you know, I, I, I'm, I'm marking some places now. And some of you all are up, but you're about the eighth or ninth year right now. It's time to be evaluating. It's like I need to be busting some moves right now. I got, to be, I got to be working on something. I need to be embracing something new. I got to be letting go of the old and embracing something new. It's a marker for change and how you do things as you get older. You no longer overwhelm problems with strength. You overwhelm problems with wisdom. You see, it's as you get older at every season of life, you, you, you need different structures to help you still stay mobile. I've seen people when they go and they're walking on their own too, to the, to the, they get a cane. as a little extra support, isn't it? Then if you have surgery or something and you got to have a walker, you've had a stroke, now you've got a walker, that's a little more support, isn't it? And a wheelchair is a little more support, isn't it? And see, people oftentimes, when you, you, you watch their progression, they go from a cane to a walker, to a wheelchair, to a bed, to the grave. Now, if you're in that wheelchair, you better start putting the brakes on. <laughs> you, you, slow your roll. Slow your roll. <laughs> but you have to have a new structure. As you age, you have to change the way you eat. You can't be 75 years old, 78 years old, down to the varsity every day eating a chili dog and cheese fries and... You, you, just, you just can't eat like that every day at a certain age. You have to change the way you eat. You have to change the way you exercise. You have to moderate your pace in which you move. You have to change, you know, how you spend money. You have to change how you take risks. The younger you are, the more risks you can take. You've got to be a certain age. You, you know, you know it's, it's easy when you're 18 years old and you risk everything because you don't have anything. But when you get to be 65, now you got, you got a little, you got 15 cents in the bank now. You don't risk it all. You might risk two of those pennies, but you, you know, you can't afford to take the same risk because you don't have as much time for recovery as a young person does. So you have to change your structure. This makes sense to anybody. So a wine skin is a structure and it has to be adjusted as you age so you don't keep doing the same thing that's why you have to embrace the new if you don't embrace the new you're going to end up hurting yourself with an old system that no longer serves you so you must create a structure or a system for where you want to go you must create a structure or a system for where you want to go because remember here that the the old wine skin is actually a type of unrenewed flesh it's a type of the old man. Notice Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And you see, you put on the new self in Christ. And when you do that, it's, it's not that you don't have any remembrance of the old self. You will remember. You'll have some memories of your old self and when you used to be out in the world. I mean, it, no matter how saved you are, you have always been saved. And you remember back when. But see, it, this, this reminds me of, of my, my grandmother. When she got around her mid-90s, she had to have one of her lower legs amputated. And they took it off right below the knee. 
So that whole lower leg and foot was gone. But I was visiting with her and she told me, she said, it looks like this foot down there is itching. Then she lifted the blanket up and she said, she said, that foot is gone, ain't it? And sure enough, it was gone. But the nerve was still alive. And she was having these phantom feelings of something that was already cut off. It was the old man. But the nerve still remembered where the old man was. And it remembered how the old man used to have an itch. And that's why you can get saved in Jesus. And it's been cut off by the blood of Jesus. But the nerve remembers the itch to sin. Are you listening? It's been cut off. The leg is gone. The foot is gone. She lifted a thing up and I mean, and I saw it. I mean, it was gone. That's no lower leg. There was no foot. It was gone. But the nerve was still alive. It held a memory. And it kept giving a flashback of a sensation that I feel this way. That ain't nothing but the old man, but it's cut off. It is dead. And then the devil will come to you and say, I thought you were saved. If you would really say, you wouldn't be feeling like this. Feelings are real, but feelings are not facts. And so the next time that the devil starts making you question your salvation, you let him know, yeah, I feel that, but it's been cut off. Jesus cut that off. He took it away as far as the east is from the west. He has separated my sin, but I remember when I used to do it. It's good. It's good for him to keep the memory of it alive in you so you don't become arrogant and think that you've been a saint all the time. That's why the scriptures had to start calling out some sin and it turned to the church people and said to them, and such were some of, such were some of you. Lest you forget. Because you see, that nerve, that nerve, and every time somebody flirts with you, they're just getting on that nerve. And you know the people that are close to you, they know what that nerve is. And some of them will wear it out. I mean, they will wear that nerve out because they, they know where all of your buttons are. And they will push them, even though it's been cut off, but that nerve is still alive. That nerve has a memory of something that used to go beyond the extension of where that thing has surgically cut it off. And that's what the blood of Jesus did for us. He drew a bloodline in the sands of time and said, you'll come thus far and no further. No more, devil. But you see, you still got the nerve that's just letting you know, mm, that's hurting, mm, that's itching, mm, that thing is thirsting. That, 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 that thing is thirsty. But it's a memory. It's a memory. And Jesus has already given us victory over that. Wine is a biblical symbol of joy and the Holy Spirit. It's a biblical symbol. So when you talk about wine, it's about joy. You know that when you get saved, you're not supposed to be depressed. It's about joy. This, it's not supposed to be solemn and you ought to look all deep and pious and stuff. You ought to have the joy of the Lord. Jesus is joy. Jesus, the joy of the Lord is our strength. I mean, you ought to have something to be excited about. You shouldn't be moping around and depressed and all of that kind of thing. You ought to have Jesus joy. Jesus is about joy. And even when you suffer with depression, remember that's just a nerve bringing that, that feeling. Just a feeling is not a fact. Not, not, feelings are not facts. It's real. I know it's real. What you feel is real. A feeling is transmitted through a nerve. And it's going to the brain and it's taking information there and making you feel that. And that feeling is so absolutely real. And you've got to deal with the realness of that feeling. And you have to remind yourself, you know, Jesus is joy. He's, he's our joy. He's the center of our joy. And he's telling us here about the wine. It's not, this, this story is really not about the, the quality of the wine or the consistency of the wine. It's actually about the containers. Old wine skin, new wine skin. Old piece of cloth, new patch. He's talking about the container. He's not talking really about what's in it. I, I, for the longest with me, I, I, would, I, would, uh, I would see water bottles and, and I notice an expiration date would be stamped on the side of the bottle, on the label of the bottle, or sometimes up underneath the bottom of the bottle. Go, ch go check out your water bottles. 
and you will discover that there's an expiration date on it. And I'm saying to myself, I mean, it's water. What? I mean, it's, it ain't no meat in here. It's not chicken water. It's not rib tip water. I mean, what's going bad? Ain't no sugar in here. There's no color. Why is the water expiring? Why is there an expiration date on there? And I did some research and I discovered this. The water never expires, but the bottle does. The bottle will start breaking down. The bottle will start deteriorating. The bottle will start leaching into the water. So there's an expiration date as to how long you can keep this housed in the bottle before the bottle begins to deteriorate and contaminate. And if you hold on to something beyond the expiration date, it'll contaminate what's on the inside of you. Contamination, there's some thing that you have to let go. The old skin will contaminate you. If, if you if had my grandmother not cut off the dead limb because of poor circulation, it would have contaminated with gangrene that would have come up that foot, up the ankle, up the lower leg, up the thigh, until it contaminated the whole body. But when this earthly tabernacle be dissolved, though the outward man is perishing day by day, yet on the inside, it is renewed day by day. So there's a difference between the content and the container. The container is dissolving, is decomposing, is getting old, has an expiration date on it. We realize that when you get winded and as you're climbing a set of stairs that you used to run up and now you got to take them at a, one at a time. And it's a terrible thing when you realize you're on the steps and you reach that age where now you have to ask yourself, was I coming up the steps or going down the steps? <laughs> when you walk out of one room and into another room and forget what you came into that room for, it's just a sign that my expiration date on this old water container, I got some wine in here, I got water in here, because out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water, and the water never gets old. But, but, but the old container is aging, and every time I walk in one room and out of another and forget why I came, it's just a reminder that there's an expiration date stamped on that water bottle. Every, every time that you, that, you, that you are winded, when you do something that you used to be able to do with ease, it's just a reminder that there's, there's an expiration date that's stamped on that Every time that another strand of hair turns gray or turns loose, it's just a reminder that there is an expiration date on that container when your stuff starts going south. I know y'all got all kind of tricks, but underneath the Botox and all of these body garments and all of this kind of stuff that holds you in one day, Silicon Valley is coming down. You may as well enjoy the view while you got it, because I'm telling you, it's got an expiration date on it. You get a pacemaker, they're going to have to go in every so many years and change the battery, because it's got an expiration date on it. If it's man-made, it will fail. If it's a wine skin, it's going to expire. It's going to get cracks in it. It's going to wrinkle. And the problem is, is that when you put new wine in it, unfermented wine, as wine is fermenting, um, it releases gases that must then expand. It expands the territory. And the problem with an old wine skin, it's already been expanded. So when you put new wine in old wine skin, the gases that are released in the fermentation process expand it more that it cracks it, tears it open, and it ruins the wine skin and the wine is on the floor. And if you've ever paid for a bottle of wine and somebody breaks it and it's on the floor, you're in trouble. But you lose both. 
And this is all that Jesus is telling us. But you always have a chain, a choice to either change or die. Either change or die. That's why I say embrace the new. Embrace the new. I love this quote by Alvin Toffler. He simply said that the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. I'd get a screenshot of that if I were you. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. That's about having the flexibility of being new wine skin because you have the expandability to say, you know what, I've got to unlearn some things and I've got to relearn some other things. So it's this, this is the superpower of the 21st century is to be able to learn, unlearn, and relearn. And so remember, this passage is not fully about the wine. It's actually about the containers that carry it. And the Word of God is it's like the wine. It gets better with time. You do realize that when you, uh, with, with grandmama's cooking, when she cooked with, with cast iron skillet, and she had real, real pots. I'm not talking about this little aluminum kind of stuff. And, and, and she, she took her time growing her own herbs, oftentimes in her own garden, and crushing them and preparing them and chopping them up and putting the fresh onion in there and the fresh... Uh, potatoes in there and cutting up her own carrots and putting her own parsley in there and, and her own radishes. And when she made stew and, and, and she put the chunks of beef in there and, and all of her seasonings, uh, the stew is better the second day. Uh, you, you, you can't be in a hurry and say, you know what, I'm going to throw this in the microwave because, you know, we're trying to eat this in like 20 minutes. You, no, no, no. The stuff that grandmama has 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 marinated in a crock pot for eight hours and 12 hours and how that meat is just falling off the bones. I mean, you can't do in a microwave, in a microwave generation and society. You cannot get that. It's, it's, that's the way the Word of God is. That's the way the wine is on the inside. It, it's, it's, it gets better as it ages. And so sometimes uh, the reason that... that uh, I can sometimes speak with a different depth is because I didn't throw it together at the last minute. I, I got it marinating sometimes for weeks at a time. You know, I, what I'm going to talk about next week is already in here marinating. It's on the back burner. It's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm letting it marinate so that all of the seasonings and the flavors get deep down into the meat so that when you taste it, and you can't do that overnight. You can't do that in five minutes. It's got to sit. It's got to sit in it, and it's got to have a little heat to it to where it is, it's, it's, it's doing what it do. And you know when you taste it that this cannot be imitated by a microwave. No matter how hungry you are for it, you can't make this in 20 minutes. Grandma had to take a long time to make that. Grandpa, they had to take a long time to make their food, and it gets better. I'm just telling you. I don't know whether you ever had any collard greens. Some of the greens are better the next day. I mean, that stuff, it is sat in all of that stuff. I'm telling you, sometimes the soup is better the next day. The stew is better the next day. It's nice to have it on that day, but it's, it's better. It's, I, I'm just telling you, because look like the seasoning gets all through it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody from the South that knows what I'm talking about? Where you have some stew, you have some greens, and that stuff is better the next day? That's the way the Word of God is. It just needs to marinate on the inside of you. And that's why older folks that have lived a little while, that they, stuff has been marinating. It's been marinating for a while. And now you see that God has something new for each of us. But before we can receive it, we must relinquish the old. Because He's got something new for each of us. But before we can receive it, you have to relinquish the old. It is the same as going into a shoe shop in order to get a new pair of shoes. You tell them your size and they go back in the stock room and they bring out your, your, the new shoes. Common sense is take the ones that you have on off. Remove the shoes that you currently have on. Take off the old man. Take off the old shoes and put these on so you can walk in a newness of life. So when they bring out the new shoes for you to be able to try on the common sense, they don't, they don't ever have to tell you, take those off. 
They just say, put these on. And you know you can't put this on until you take that off. That's what I'm talking about, embracing the new. You have to be able to take the old off so you can embrace the new. You cannot put new shoes on over old shoes. It, it, it doesn't work. It's not like a, it's not like a blouse. It, that, uh, you have to take it off in order to put on the new. You have to take it off in order to put on the new. So just think of it in, 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 in those terms because if somebody were to take the, the unfermented and put it into, into old wineskin as it breathes, as it releases its gases, it's going to split it and tear it and both the wineskin and the wine are going to be lost. And you've got to shed stuff in your own daily life and I want you to ask yourself what do you need to shed what do you need to shed what do you need to pull off as it relates to your old man uh, what do you need to shed? do you need to shed tears do you need to shed pounds or toxic people or toxic relationships bad habits do you need to shed fears do you need to shed uh, self-limiting or self-defeating thoughts what do you need to shed here's what I want you to realize is that every day humans shed 500 million cells 500 million skin cells are shed by human beings every single day every human being sheds 500 million skin cells every day that's a lot of that's a lot of skin cells a half a billion skin cells are shed from your body every day. You wonder where dust comes from in the room? Human skin. Dandruff, human skin. Five hundred, a half a billion skin cells shed every day, which means that every two to four weeks, your entire outer layer of skin is totally new. Every two to four weeks shedding a half a billion cells a day every human being if you don't trust me go home and look it up i've already done the research <laughs> but a half a billion cells are shed every day what does that tell you about some stuff that we need to shed you have to give up in order to go up you want to go to another level you got to give up the stuff that you've been in love with you, you have to give up in order to to go up you've got to shed some stuff what needs shedding in your life? What needs shedding? Do you need to shed tears? Do you know that tears pull toxins out of the body? That's why when you have a good hard cry, you feel better, even if nothing has changed. If somebody cheated on you, you cry your eyeballs out. After that hard cry, you feel better because toxins were literally delivered out of your body because of what you shed. What do you need to shed in your life? It'll make you feel better. And not only will you feel better, it'll actually empower you to be able to do better. What do you need to shed? Your body is already shedding a half a billion cells a day. Your body is shedding. You thought that snakes were the only one who shed their skin. And every day, little by little, cells are coming out. They're coming out. You wondered where dust comes from. It's dead human cells, skin cells, a half a billion a day. My, some of y'all got some cleaning to do in your houses. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's in the trillions, the quadrillions, the quintillions of, of, of cells that have piled up just because of the shedding process. But to grow, we've got to be able to lay some things aside. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, notice. Therefore, since we are encompassed with such a great cloud of witnesses let us also lay aside lay aside shed lay aside every weight and the sin I want you to see that not everything is a sin but it's a weight there are some things that are not sins directly but they are weights it's holding you down it's slowing you down who are you running with how are you spending your time it may be something that is a weight to you it may not mean that spending time on the internet is a sin, but it may be a weight. Or watching too much television or doing too much uh, uh, of this. It may not be a sin, but it may be a weight and it's slowing you down. And notice he said, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Look, let us look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, the, the, the fact of the matter is this. Jesus did not come into the world to destroy the law. He simply came to fulfill its purpose. Notice what Jesus said in, in, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. He says, don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophet. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. This is Jesus speaking. I came to accomplish their purpose. So he's explaining to us that there is a difference between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. The letter of the law is like the old skin, the old wine skin. The spirit of the law is the new wine skin. And so it's, 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 a, it's a different. Notice what he says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter of the law, but of the spirit for the letter kills and the spirit gives life you see jesus didn't change the wine he just brought us new wine skin uh, the new wine skin is a new framework it's a new perspective it's a new understanding it's a new way of thinking and seeing how god is actually moving and it's like no 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 what we really don't want to do this is not about corporal punishment this is about correction in love we, we don't want to just beat the child to death. We want to correct them in love. And with one child, you can speak to them and they'll start crying and be repentant over it. And the next child, you got to beat them to death. <laughs> and then they still puffing and swelling up at you. It's, a, it, it's, it's not about the letter of the law to just say, hey, do all of this corporal punishment. It's saying, find out what's driving that behavior. He says, I want you to get to the spirit. Figure out how to communicate with them. Figure out what really drove them to do. Uh, th this is about something. This is about something. May I say this to you? If you're ever dealing with rebellion in any person, a human being, a husband, a wife, a son, or a daughter, the root of all rebellion is distrust. Let me say that again. The root of all rebellion is distrust. And it is saying that I, somebody that I trusted violated my trust and they hurt me, they abandoned me, they abused me in some way, and I will never put myself in that position again. So my rebellion becomes a way that I said I stay in control because I don't trust you because I know I won't hurt me. And if you tell me to do something, even if it's good, I'm not going to do it because you might hurt me. It's rebellion is a trust issue at its core, at the spirit of it. It's about trust. It's not I told this boy to do this or this girl to do this and they start huffing at me and why I got to do it this your house. No, no, no. This is about trust. Build the trust. You don't want to follow people blindly that you don't trust. But if you trust them, see, if somebody's going to protect you, you got to trust them. If somebody tells you I got your back, you got to trust them. But if, the, if another person told you I got your back, and then they let you go out and you get hurt. Now the next person tell you, I got your back. He's like, see, your trust has been broken. And now it's like, dude, no, I ain't doing nothing. Because your trust is broken. And the real spirit behind that is distrust. It's not rebellion. Distrust. Rebellion is the fruit of distrust. Rebellion is the fruit of distrust. Don't get upset at the fruit. Go to the root. Jesus is saying, I'm trying to teach you how to deal with roots. The Lord, letter of the law deals with the fruit. I want to teach you about the root. Find the root. Go to the root. And so he takes us in Matthew chapter 5, and I want to encourage you on your own time to read that entire fifth chapter of the book of Matthew because Jesus goes through a litany of particular things telling us, you have heard of old, saying that the law said this, but I say unto you. And he's correct, and I just want to pull out uh, two or three of them here. Matthew 5, 21, Jesus said, You have heard it said, do not murder, but I say to you that anyone who is angry with a brother will be subject to judgment. Jesus said, listen, uh, murder is not the problem. It's uncontrolled anger. He says, if you are angry with your brother, that's how murder starts. You get angry. And the anger then clouds your judgment, your perception. 
And he says, anyone who's angry with the brother, he says, that that's, the law says don't murder. The law says don't murder, but he says, anyone who's angry with a brother is going to be subject. Jesus said, that's what the law said, but here's the spirit that's behind it. You, are, are you getting it? Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 and 39. You've heard it said, here's what the law said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But Jesus said, but I say unto you, he says, here, here's, here's the spirit of, what, of it. Whoever strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other one as well. You know what that really says? I mean, if somebody strikes you on the right cheek, turn to them the other side. Here's the spirit of that. Show them a better way. Somebody wants to use violence against you, show them a better way. You don't fight fire with fire, you'll get a bigger fire. He's saying if somebody strikes you here, if they, if they demonstrate violence, belligerence, you know, fighting on one side, that may be all they know. They might have come up in nothing but a cussing, fighting environment, and that's all they know. He's saying, offer to them an alternative way of resolving this. This is the only way they know how to solve conflict. He says, show them a better way. That's the spirit of what he's trying to communicate. Show them a better way. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 and, and 43 and 44. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But Jesus said, hey, 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 here's the spirit of it. Love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. He says, take a different thing. He says, he says it's really not your enemy. He says, the devil is really your enemy. But love the person that the devil is using. Pray for them. Pray for them. Not that God would destroy them. Pray that God would open their eyes. Pray that he would show them the error of their way so that he would lead them to a path of, of redemption and salvation. You don't want to pray that they die and go to hell. You want to pray that their eyes are open so they can be redeemed. That's the spirit of the law. The letter kills, the spirit gives life. And let me remind you of this. The Old Testament was good, but the New Testament is better. And may I say this to you, good is the enemy of best. Now, let's let that sink in for just a moment. Good is the enemy of best because too many people allow good enough to make them complacent. That's good enough. That's the reason that they don't go any higher. It's the reason that they don't expand anymore. This is the reason that they don't learn anymore. That's good enough. That's good enough. That's good enough. That's good enough. I, I, I had an older gentleman. I, I found out that he was uh, illiterate didn't know how to read and I said to him you know I said I will pay for you to get private tutors so that you don't have to sit in a class and be embarrassed you know what he said to me he said thank you for that offer thank you but no thank you I've already come this far in my life and he was much older than me he said I've already come this far and my children are educated they have advanced degrees he said this is good enough but you see, that good enough is a stopping point. Yeah. It says, I will never grow beyond this. Yeah. That's why I said good is the enemy of best. Yeah. And here's what I want you to think about. Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the world. Between the years of 1921 to 2006, 192 people have died climbing that mountain and trying to descend the mountain. But here's the interesting part. More people died coming down from the mountain that died trying to go up it. You know why? Because when you live for stuff, for money, and for position, and you get there, and that's all, because now you're asking, what next? What next? What next? And when you have been to the summit, when you've been to the zenith, the peak of the mountain, and what next now? And now you're trying to rush to your next thing. And what happens, they descend too fast before the body has a time to adjust. And they kill themselves in the process. Trying to descend, trying to come down after they peak. They hit their peak. They kill themselves. More people die on the way down. Check it out. I've already done the research. More people die going down from the mountain then they die trying to go up the mountain because I've been there now is that all it what do I do now 
Where do I go now? Where is my significance and my value now? It is at that time that you got to trust God to lead you. When you feel as though I've already been to the mountaintop and I've looked over and I've done everything that I can do. Don't die before you die. Don't let anybody put you in the ground before it's time for you to go in the ground. Live until the last minute with excitement and zest and enthusiasm and passion. Find something that is your reason to live because there is another blessing beyond the mountaintop. You can find joy in the valley. When you've been on the mountaintop with Jesus, with God, he'll always send you back to the valley. You get something from the mountain, it's, it's constantly making that trip that the only reason that I've gone up here is so I can go down here. And see, I sometimes feel as though I'm, 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 I'm the only reason that I'm here as a senior pastor of this church is because this is my season. I'm still in the game. I'm on the field. I'm still catching the ball. Like, Jesus, get, I'm open, and he's passing me the ball. And what you're getting now, he passes it to me, and I'm passing it to you. But there'll be a, there'll be a time. It's not going to be a long time. There will be a time that I'm taken out of this game of being a player on the field to being a coach. Are you listening? And, and now the coach is in a different position that is helping other people to do what I have done. Are you listening? It, it is, it's, it's life beyond the mountain peak. And it's giving value to say, I'm extending the game. I mean, after I take the baton that's in my hand and hand it off, I still want the race to be run. There's still something beyond me that the destiny is not fulfilled in me. I'm just a conduit. Maybe God used me to get it started. I'm the founder, but I'm not the finisher. He's the alpha and the omega. He's got the omega that's coming after me. Are you listening? It's not about me. He needed me to get it started. But if I've got to hand it off, if I'm going to be in his will and coach them to be able to do better than what God has graced me to be able to do. And it doesn't make me insecure. I am secure. And my footsteps are sure like a mountain goat is in climbing the mountain and descending the mountain. It's being able to come to that place. And I'm going to give this to someone who's already felt like you've, you've peaked out. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 16 through 19. God says, I am the Lord who opens a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. God says, I will do something that is miraculous in a place where it shouldn't happen. I'm going to make water come in a dry place. And he says, I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots and horses. And I drew them beneath the winds, I, and, and they drowned. He says, I'm going to get rid of all your enemies. Their lives snuffed out like a smoldering candlestick. He says, but forget all of that. Yeah, I took you through some high experiences. Yeah, you've had some marvelous victories. But he says, forget all of that. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do. Ha, woo, my God. Somebody ought to get excited right there. It's nothing. It is nothing compared to what I am going to do. For I am about to do something new. Oh, my God. He says, see, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway in the wilderness, and I'm going to create rivers in the dry wasteland. I'm going to take water in a place where it's not supposed to be. I'm going to take it to a place of death a place where, that is dry and I'm going to bring a flourishing thing. I'll take you into neighborhoods and subdivision and I'll help you to be able to do what they said would never work in this part of town. God, God said I'll take people that don't have the degrees and he said when I do it, when I do it, he said behold, 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 I will do a new thing. I'm going to do something brand new. He said, shall you not see it? He said, do you not realize it's already in process? It's already in process. He's already ordering your steps. He's already ordering your step. God is setting you up for the biggest finish of your life. My God, Moses didn't die in a valley. He died on a mountain. And I declare in the name of Jesus, you don't have to go to a low place. 
You walk with him. You walk with him. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. The steps of a good man, Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man, a gaber. A gaber is a male warrior. You're a warrior. Why would he call you a warrior if you were not going to have enemies? If there was not going to be something that's going to oppose your success and your victory. If there's not going to be something going after your seed and trying to destroy the fruit of your ministry and your life. That's why as God blesses your life, now you become a protector. You've got to steward the blessing to say, Lord, I'm a warrior now. The devil doesn't come after you until you have something. He doesn't break into, into places that are impoverished. He wants to go where the value is. He's coming after value. And as God builds value in your life and in your children, you see, you have to understand that every place, that in the place where you are most vulnerable is also the place where you are most valuable. Woo, my God. If you're vulnerable with your children, that's where your value is. Whatever makes you vulnerable, there's value there. Whatever makes you vulnerable, there's value there. Oh, marikamas. That the very weakness that you think is weakness. God said, that's, that's the place where I make myself strong. It could be your lack of education. That's a weakness. That's a vulnerable spot. But God says, I'll be strong in, in that. He says, not many, not many mighty, not many wise, not many noble. He said, I will take the rejected thing, the base thing, the uneducated thing, and put my glory on it. God says, I'll do something, and they'll know that this didn't come by the degree of an institution, that this came by the sovereignty of the hand of God. God says, I'm going to do something that only I can do. I will cause the naysayers to be the ones that will be under the wheel in the water up underneath you. God was the one that lured them there and then closed the waters in over them. God says, if you look to me, I will fight your battle. May I say this to you? You're looking for a plan? God says, I don't have a plan. I am the plan. I am your plan. I am your plan. I'm your shield and your buckler. I am your strong tower. I am your defender. I am the lifter of your head. I am your healer. He says, listen, I don't have a strategy. I am your strategy. I am your rear guard. I got everything that's been in your past. May I, may I unpack this just for a moment here? When the Lord said, I'm your rear guard, that's the guard in the back. That's what guards your back. It's your past that you think is going to creep up and embarrass you. Oh, my, my bad. But where you've been is a place of power. Every place that you have been is a place of power. Everything that God has delivered you out of is a place of power. He said, I, I, I'm your rear guard. I got your back. I got your back. I got your back. All of that craziness, all of that foolishness that you did back there, God says, I have your back. I will guard, stand guard against it. Though they try to use it against you, it'll never destroy you. It'll never bring you down as you submit it to me. I got your back. I got your back. That's your testimony. That's your testimony of the glory of God. God is in the midst of doing something even now. Even now. Even now. Shall you not know it? My God, he's in the business of doing something. God's got your back. He is your defender. He's your strong tower. He is your answer. He doesn't just have an answer. He is the answer. Moses was looking for God to say, God, huh? what's going to happen, Lord? God says, I'm a pillar of cloud by day, and I am a pillar of fire by night. That's my strategy. I am the strategy. I am your protector in the day and the night. I am your protector. I got you. You got legal stuff you're dealing with? Hey, my shikol of all. God says, I am. I am. I am. I am. Look to him. He's the author and the finisher. He's everything that you could ever need. I'm just telling you, that's what God is. He doesn't have a plan. He is the plan. He is the plan. How are you going to do this, God? How are you going to pay for this, God? 
there won't be any other explanation. It's not that somebody else granted it. They granted it because of God. God, God did it. I, I dare you to just tell somebody around you, God did it. That whatever is good in my life, God did it. 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 He is the answer. He doesn't have a shield. He is a shield. He doesn't have a rock. He is a rock. He doesn't have bread. He is the bread. He doesn't have living water. He is the living water. God is. God is. God is. Your best days are ahead. Your best days are ahead. Lo mejor está por venir. Your best days. The best is yet to come. Prophesy to somebody. Tell them the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. The best. I know you've had it good, but the best. Woo! May I tell you today, he always saves the best wine for last. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Don't be concerned because you feel like you're getting up in age because all of the games are won in the fourth quarter. Yes! 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 The Lord does not merely give victory. The Lord is victory. He is my victory. He doesn't merely give peace. He is my peace. My God, my God, my God. I'm just here to tell you that God is up to something. God is up to something. It's time to embrace the new. Set your faith in God that whatever it is, I want to trust you to be able to do what I've never seen you do before. God, whatever it is, I trust you. I know that all things are possible with you. Take the limits off today. Embrace the new. Embrace the spirit of the living God that says, I want to do something that you've never seen before. I want to take you to places that you've never been. God says, I'm going to blow your mind. God is going to take you into some glorious experiences. He's going to let you get a mountaintop view. It's going to be glorious. He's saying, come up hither, come up hither, come up hither. Take a look around and watch what God will do. Submit it to him, submit it to him. Because I know, I heard the Lord says that the thing that has been a persistent problem that you've not been able to conquer, he says he's about to make a quick end of it. Woo! Yes, he is. Yes! 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 Yes to your will, Lord! Yes to your way, yes! We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.